welcome back everybody uh, another amazing interview with another amazing author author as part of our independent thinking online children's book festival um we've had a, i've had the pleasure of interviewing authors throughout the week in our some of our pre-recorded slots and then this weekend saturday and sunday in june uh interviewing uh, so many authors uh, with a live audience and um so many authors with so much to say two children, about children, four children, four parents, about parents, but coming at things, we all want the best for children, clearly, whoever we are, whether we're a teacher or a parent, but there are so many ways that we can work out what's best for children and so many things that, that, that we can address. And uh, and this session is exactly the same, because, but coming at it again in a slightly different way, because of this book, Help My Toddler Is Not Eating, a 30 day plan to get your picky eater to enjoy new food. We'll find out all about neophobia and picky eating. And uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Elizabeth Roberts, the uh, author of this book. So, Elizabeth, welcome. Welcome to this session. Um, tell us just, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you do, how you how you get into what, you, what you've what you done, how you came to be writing this sort of book. Yeah. Hi there, and great to be here today, some really great authors. Um, so yeah, so I'm a state registered dietitian, and a few years ago I was um, asked to run a project that was looking at getting young children to eat better. And at the time I knew what children should be eating, but I was faced with this problem about how do you get them to eat when they're picky eaters? So I was tasked with writing a program for families um, and I was also referred lots of families and young people whose child just wouldn't eat. Um, so it set me on a bit of a path of exploring, researching everything about the topic, looking at all the literature about how do children learn to eat, uh, what can get in the way of that and what can we take from that? And that's really distilled into this book. Um, so what, what I've tried to do is to um, give parents, so it's a 30 day program. So each day has a little bit of bite-sized information, a little bit of that research, a little bit of that experience. This is one little nugget of that, one little piece of the puzzle. And then parents get to practice something with their child every day. So at the end of every day, there's an exercise. Uh, try this at home. And they're really, really easy exercises. They aren't, they aren't hard exercises. So it's something to do with your child that tackles the particular thing that we sort of looked, looked at on that day. Okay, all right. You, 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 you're in the countryside because there's a fly keeps going past. So there must be the flowers next to you. That's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or the heat, the sunshine has woken them up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it is. And um, so, state registered nutritionist is that what you say? Uh, di dietitian. Dietitian, dietitian. How, how how does that come? Out? I've never heard of that before. How do you how do you practice as a, how did did you practice in that role? How do you get into that role? Yeah, um, so we are so we train in nutrition and dietetics, and it's a registered uh, a registered role. So we're registered with the Health and Care Professions Council, um, similar to physiotherapists and speech therapists. And we will be working some in independent practice, some in the National Health Service, and we can be working in a wide variety of roles. So in the community, in hospitals, in various programmes. And so, yeah, how in that particular role, um, uh, children were referred to me who, who weren't eating, who weren't eating very well or weren't eating. Um, uh, OK, OK. So, uh, and so what's at the heart of a child who's... Where is a, a picky a picky eater a, a a an issue that needs medical support, and where is it just a child who just doesn't like their greens? How do you separate the two? So there are there 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 are almost a continuum, I would say, rather than specific um, a specific cut off point. Although we will often use some cut off points like the number of foods that a child will eat, so less than ten foods or less than twenty foods. There are um, some questionnaires and diagnostic tools that can separate out children that are really fussy, eat, that, that have, a, have an eating problem, so a feeding problem versus more typical fussy eating, um, which children will experience to different degrees. Um, so yeah, there is a medical diagnosis of something called avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Um, and there are questionnaires that can differentiate that. Okay. Okay. And and 
I mean, how how serious can it get? What, 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 why are we why are we looking at medical support for it? Well, ultimately, will the child just not get hungry and eat anyway, or, or is it is that far too simplistic? I know, but fill us in. Yeah, a, a range of problems really. Um, as a dietitian, we perhaps think of the nutritional problems. So over a long period of time, children can become deficient in particularly some of the micronutrients, so iron and zinc, um, they will have a poorer range of diet. They can start to get problems like problems with their bowels and constipation. Um, so typically picky eaters will eat less of the foods that, that help with that. Um, some children can start to have problems with growth. So they're not getting enough nutrition to carry on growing well. And I talk about that in one chapter of this book to really reassure parents if their child is growing well um, and where to seek help if, if, if he or she isn't. Um, longer term, picky eating tends to stay with us as adults um, or rather more severe selective eating might stay with us as adults. So some children will grow out of picky eating and start to eat more as they grow up, um, but some children won't. So there are links with childhood uh, restrictive eating or picky eating and then adult selective eating. Um, and that can then start to have an impact on social interactions, for example, um, choosing where to go to eat. Um, yeah. No, OK, I, I've just uh, somebody gave me a salad for lunch and it involved eating raw tomatoes, which is not something that I enjoy. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so it, it does stay with you. But it's yeah. is it the texture, Ian? Yes, it's it is. It's the texture, yeah. <laughs> and I made a big note in the book when I read your book about this texture thing. And it is people say, what, what's, what, what do you like about tomatoes? It's just how they feel. So that, that's a that's the thing, is it? It's not just about taste it, or it, it could be other senses that are involved as well that are putting us off certain foods. Yeah, absolutely, texture. So some people are more um, sensory aware of um, tastes or textures. Um, but some of that we can, we can with exposure, with um, repeated exposure to things, we can start to become more familiar with those and more um, accepting of those. But yes, yeah, some people I can do little more tomatoes, sensitive. I can't do big tomatoes. So I start with the little ones, start with the cherry tomatoes and <laughs> yeah. I work up to the big buffalo ones or whatever. Yeah, they've got, they've got a harder skin, haven't they? So you haven't got that slimy texture inside. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, all right. We're gonna get or on. taking the seeds out. So you're just starting with the firm bit of the tomato. Ah, uh, okay. Oh yeah, that, that would have been a good one for my mum. I'll eat the tomato, but can you de-seed it before we... <laughs> <laughs> before I touch it because then you're moving into and talking to tomatoes the one that's even worse which is the tin tomatoes um you get out the can that are all sort of just this, this wet sort of sludgy ball which takes me back to school dinners and, and I just the, the smell the feeling of it so is, is there an element where it's not it, it's actually something that happened in the past that's put us off the food as opposed to anything sensory absolutely absolutely and food aversions stay with us and and this is why Particularly in the book, there's one, two chapters that look at why we shouldn't be force feeding children to eat or really cajoling or coaxing children to eat. Because if they have a, 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 um, an aversive experience, they will learn to dislike that food. So, so children are, I think we forget sometimes as adults that we, for, for the most part, we're really, really good at eating. We can eat, we can eat half reclined we can eat driving we can eat talking we can eat walking we can eat working um, but children are still learning how to eat so they're learning how to do it how to get the food into their mouth how to manipulate the texture how big a bite they can take how to get it into a form that they can safely swallow but they're also learning what to eat so humans don't really have very many instincts about what to eat we think we do but we don't most of, of how we learn what to eat we learn from um, socially so from watching other pe people and being exposed to that food and then through our experience of it. So what happens to us when we have that food? Um, and, we, and children are very, very good at learning that. They're very, very good at learning. If I have a bad experience to a food or in relation to a food, I don't like that food. <laughs> wow. OK, so so getting the dinners right and I'm, and I'm back to school dinners again. I'm back to cabbage now. Uh, and that's the incident at primary school. So yeah, okay, so we're getting it right now sets us up a, a longer term. I mean, the two things that you just talked about, there's, we can come back to the rats. Yeah. <laughs> but talk about the blue, um, the blue food experiment, because this idea that children learn by copying 
others, whether it's their peers or whether it's parents or maybe even teachers. It's the idea of you know, schools where the teachers sit down and have their lunch with children and actually they're doing, you're doing more than just building the social side of it and that we're gathering together to break bread together, which is really important, but they're modelling the eating of foods, which I hadn't thought of before. So tell us about the Blue Food Experiment. So the Blue Food Experiment was done by, um, I think she's Professor now, Greenhall in, in Wales, and she split children into... Uh, into two groups so she had very young children so their median age was between three and five the average age was four and what they did is split the the little children into two groups and they had older children in each of the two groups so in one of the groups the older children had been taught by the researchers to um, to eat the food and to make noises and, and make that they enjoyed this food and the other group the older children were taught to not eat the food and to make yuck sounds I don't like this this is disgusting and they 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 they, they observed then what happened with the younger children and the younger children would not eat the food where the older children had modeled that this food is yuck um, and what's really interesting is, is the food that they tried was, was a blue food. And they, they specifically used a blue food because children, because we don't have any blue foods, children would have had no previous exposure or learning about whether to like it or whether to not like it. Um, they then, for the second part of the experiment, they made cereal bars that they had colored blue um, and gave these to the younger children in the two groups. And the group that had had role modeled, this is yuck, this is disgusting, wouldn't eat the second blue food either, so the blue cereal bar. Um, so they had made that connection that this color was yuck, was disgusting, um, and then wouldn't eat that when it traveled into another type of food, even without the older children role modeling it now. So that's, that, that's really, really important. To, so the, the, the role that the parent plays or the teacher said, like I said, in, in just modelling that, that healthy, eating properly, eating decent food is, we're not forcing children, but it's subtler than that, isn't it? It's a, it's a su suggestive thing that's, that's going on there. Yeah. And, then, and then the idea about tasting it and not liking it. And I didn't realise until reading your book that rats can't vomit. <laughs> I know. So, so, so tell us about the rats and how that applies to, to children and, and adults as well. Yeah, so rats. So rats. So a lot of the research on appetite and how we eat is unfortunately done in mice and rats. Um, and rats in particular, um, they they rats learn how to eat in the same way that humans learn how to eat. Um, and what they do is they they will um, nibble a little bit of food and wait and see what happens. Um, and this is in part why it's quite difficult to poison rats. Um, they will have a little bit of the poison and wait to see if something happens. Um, and if something bad happens, then they won't have any more of it. Um, and, and this is how humans also will often try a new food. Um, as adults, we don't really see it that often, but you might observe it now that when, you're, when people are trying something new, they will nibble a little bit of it, but certainly children will do that. So they'll have a little nibble of a new food and they'll put it down and leave it. But really, this is just evolution. This is how they learn to eat. <laughs> I, I saw a recommendation recently for a school lunchbox. Rather than like giving them one big sandwich, you give them about four or five different things because they tend to just, I'll have a bite of this and I'll have a bite of that. And it's so just allow them to do that rather than just one sandwich, they have a little bite and then, and then yeah. move on. Um, what, the, what is the role of parents beyond what we've talked about? Because sometimes you, uh, parents will feel guilty, won't they, about when you know, the child's going to the party and, and, and all, the, all the nice children are eating their falafel and broccoli bake and this child's looking for the chips and the, and the fish fingers. So how, what is the role that parents play in that? And then also because so many of the people looking at this are going to be from a, an education background, what, what role can schools play in that in terms of encouraging children to eat full stop? and then encouraging them to eat healthily. Yeah, I think, so for schools, just answering that first, I think for teachers, really not forcing children to eat, um, giving them the exposure, giving them the foods, having the foods there, but not forcing them to eat anything in particular. Like your experience with cabbage, I imagine that you were forced, you were encouraged, you were coaxed to finish that cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the other really important thing is for teachers is to be aware of how you're approaching a food. When I was running this program in Wales, so many, so many parents without even knowing it, their face told me what they thought of this particular food. And thinking about tomatoes, there was actually one mum that 
hated tomatoes so we we tried to get we got the parents to try foods and, and her face as she put this tomato to her face was and her little kid was just looking at her and I, and I, I could just tell there was no way this kid was going to eat tomato now <laughs> she had seen her mum's face um so maybe just thinking about that we're not always aware how we're um, how we're expressing ourselves around food, but kids are so tuned into it. Mm. This is how they learn. They watch us and see what how we react and see what we do. So if you don't like it, don't. It's better to not have any than to role model yuck, disgusting. Yeah. Um, or if you really really try try, and we taught parents to sort of put it up to your mouth and then take it away without them noticing that you hadn't actually eaten it. <laughs> it's, the, it's, a, it's a similar thing with maths. When the parents say, oh, I hate maths, I hate maths, um, we, we transfer it. Can you give us a little, we're, oh, the time, we're, we're against the clock. Wow, look at that, it goes so quickly. Give us a little taster of the, pardon the pun, uh, some of the things that are in the book then. So the book looks out, it, it goes through in a very logical order. So it starts really with nutrition. So we look at uh, what children need to have, getting enough iron, getting enough zinc, food groups, portion sizes. Um, and then it moves into more of the mealtime management strategies. So some of those will have a parenting focus, like giving praise, like uh, using bribes and treats or not. Um, and a lot of it is around exposing child, the child in different ways to food. So uh, to, to particular foods and to new foods. So we know that children can become used to a food and more likely to try it if they've been exposed to it in other ways. So smell, having it around, pictures, and lots of the exercises use strategies to, 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 to do that. Um, and then they're also very structured exercises on how to, to actually introduce a new food in a sort of structured non-threatening way for a child who's quite anxious about new foods. Um, and the very end of the book we look at some of the problems that may have caused the picky eating or some problems that may come alongside it like managing constipation, a child who's had reflux. Um, we also, I also look at positioning in, in the book as well. So making sure that children are positioned well for eating. Again, this is something that we forget as adults because we're just so good at eating. <laughs> we, we, we can do it half reclined. We forget that they need to be in a good position. They need everything that they can to, to practice the jaw movements. They, that, yeah, so it looks a little bit at that as well. Mm. Okay. Have you got any, 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 you want to read a little extract from it? Is there anything you want to share? Um, I might just, um, so we talked about the blue foods. Um, I might just share, um, I might just share one of the exercises, um, just a little picture of one of them. So this is exercise on day 17. So it's messy play, playing with food. Um, so that gives you an idea um, of the sort of exercises that you're doing. Um, that particular day has two days. Um, two exercises. So the second one is using pictures, um, using food pictures and things to do with your child with food pictures. Um, thinking about an extract from it, I might, um, I might just um, uh, read a little bit from the uh, finish your soup exercise, yeah. um, which was on page um, 124. Um, so this was the exercise, uh, this was the research study where they, um, so one thing I talk about is not coercing or forcing children. Um, so this particular study was called Finish Your Soup, Counterproductive Effects of Pressuring Children to Eat. Um, so children were split for this study into two groups and offered identical soup for lunch. The first group was allowed to eat as much or as little of the soup as they wanted. The second group was coaxed and cajoled into finishing their soup. At the end of the meal, both groups were asked how much they liked the soup. The group that had been coaxed and cajoled liked the soup less than the group that had been allowed to eat as much or as little as they wanted. I wonder what the children in the second group would say if they were offered that same soup again, or in your case, cabbage. Yeah, cabbage <laughs> this, so many of the stories and, and the books that we've, took, uh, that we've covered, it's about empowering the child, letting the child take responsibility for and uh, understand what's going on and, and take responsibility for their actions, for their feelings, for their thoughts, for their whatever it might be. And this is exactly the same thing. It's rather than forcing the child, it's working with the child to allow the child to make the choices. So you, you keep that internal locus of control, which is good for well-being and good for health and happiness. And as you're speaking, I can't help but think of the Pink Floyd 
uh, the brick in the wall where the Scottish head teachers shout, and how can you have your pudding if you haven't had your meat? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's that sort of coercive sort of thing. You've got to have that, and you can't leave the table. There's a Simpsons, isn't there, where they uh, uh, Bart and Homer spend about three days sitting at the table arguing over one little bit of broccoli that's left. It's it, 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 We create these confrontations, and what you show in the book, it doesn't have to be that way, that we can, without giving in, without caving in, without letting them off, having healthy food. There are other ways of approaching things that are far more beneficial it's all around. Yeah. So how can, I mean, I think you, uh, um, we've, well, we've got the Roving Bookshop um, and a lot of the books are available through there. Um, and the, the, the website address is on the website, uh, their website address is on our website. How can people get hold of you um, uh, through, uh, uh, yeah, social media and the likes, Elizabeth? How, how can they, how can people find you? Yeah, so the book can be found on Amazon. Um, people can go to my website, which is fussyaboutfood.com nice and easy and I'm on Facebook as Dr Elizabeth Roberts and on Instagram and Twitter as um, at Doc Roberts Diet so that's D-O-C Roberts R-O-B-E-R-T-S Diet D-I-E-T. Lovely okay thank you for that thank you for that book there's all sorts of just wonderful practical stuff in there It'd be interesting to use that in part with where the parents, in part with the family, in partnership with the schools can really sort of address these things and, and set the right sorts of habits up for children in, in terms of their food and nutrition going, going forward. So that's really useful. Thank you for that. Go out and enjoy the, enjoy the West Country sunshine while you can. Um, I'll see you again. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, have a good day, Ian. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.